And uh, with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, uh, Yolanda uh, Martinez San Miguel, to introduce our speaker for tonight. So I'm honored to introduce my colleague, uh, Dr. Omar Vargas, on behalf of the Michelle Bauman Underwood Department of Modern Languages and Literatures. Uh, at the University of Miami. Uh, Dr. Vargas joined us in 2015. He has a uh, BA in Mathematics from the Universidad Nacional de Colombia, an MA in Latin American Literature from the Pontificia Universidad Javeriana in Bogota, and a PhD from the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, and I remember that when I joined the department and I read Omar's profile, I thought it was really, we were really lucky to have a poet and a mathematician among our faculty. So Dr. Vargas studies the relationship between science and literature with an interest in exploring the ways in which scientific knowledge and modes of thinking transform literature and the way in which literature is also a special space to speculate about new theories of knowledge. His research has three main areas. First, uh, mathematical references in the works of Cuban writer Jose Lezama Lima, Mexican writer Salvador Elizondo, and Colombian writer Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Second, a series of articles about different aspects of Gabriel Garcia Marquez's works, such as condensation of time and space in a series of repeating scenes that he compares to Mandelbrot fractals, and this he denominates fractalismo mágico. Uh, the overlapping cultural references in Beatles songs and Garcia Marquez narratives, and the representation of dementia, memory, and cognitive issues in several of his short stories and novels. And third, uh, references to scientific writing in Ernesto Sabato's literary works, which is the work, uh, the topic of his second book project. These projects showcase an in-depth knowledge of the text analyzed, and they also include a solid archival research on Jose Lezama Lima and, uh, and Ernesto Sabato. He has published articles on Latin American and Caribbean literary and cultural studies in important academic journals, such as Latin American Research Review, Symposium, a quarterly journal of modern literatures, Ciberletras, and Neophilologus, among others. Aside from his scholarship and research, Dr. Vargas is part of the contingent of colleagues in my department who are excellent, excellent teachers. I was fortunate enough to visit his class, Garcia Marquez and the Beatles. Isn't that a cool topic? <laughs> and I was able to witness his stellar pedagogical talents. Students in Omar Vargas's classes participate in an ongoing dialogue in which they perform careful historical contextualizations, meticulous close readings, and sometimes they even embody the voice and perspective of the different narrators, character, characters, and historical figures depicted in the literary and cultural pieces that he's analyzing in class. I learned so much when I visited his uh, classes and I understood why he consistently gets uh, perfect scores in, her stu in his student evaluations. He's also a very generous colleague who cares deeply about our academic and teaching programs at MLL. On a personal note, however, uh, I have a word from some of our colleagues in MLL who I'm representing today. I've been told that he loves, loves, loves the Boston Red Sox. <laughs> sorry, 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 sorry. No, my area of expertise. No, no, no. The Yankees, the Yankees, the Yankees. Sorry, sorry. He, <laughs> he also has an athletic side. Uh, he loves Colombian soccer. Uh, and keep in mind that in Miami, soccer is equivalent to golf in, soccer, you know, in other parts of the country. So he supports his second career as a soccer player by eating healthy salads, wraps, and other unremarkable menu items, <laughs> except when he gets his hands around a good bandeja paisa. Yeah. And I've also heard he's also a great companion and listener during uh, some secret happy hours that happen in our department. <laughs> so today we're presenting his first monograph, Cantidades Hechizadas y Silogísticas del Sobresalto, La Secreta Ciencia de José Lezama Lima, published by Purdue University Press. This book is a study of mathematical references in José Lezama Lima's work, but it also showcases one of Omar's special talents. The titles of his books, articles, and chapters are among the most original and playful I have seen. And in this book, um, Dr. Vargas shares with us original archival research along with his meticulous close readings of poetry and mathematics, two sublime languages for the manifestation of the subtleties of, the human, of human knowledge and imaginations. So congratulations, Omar, on the publication of your book. You. And the floor, dear colleague, is all yours.
Thank you. And just for the record, I'm a Yankees fan. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Logan. <laughs> that was Logan. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Yolanda, for your kind words. Uh, thank you, Hugh Thomas, the Center of the Humanities and Books and Books for this opportunity. And thank you all for being here tonight. This is the first time I will talk about my book, a creature that has been, until now, confined to some sort of silent existence. Allow me to begin with some very personal considerations. I first began my academic career studying mathematics at Universidad Nacional de Colombia because I was convinced that was my call. For many years, I was a high school mathematics professor in Bogota, where I was born. However, I also had a strong affinity for reading and writing, and eventually, I started a master's program in Latin American literature. I could not help but approach my literary studies by following the principle which states that if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. It was inevitable for me to use my mathematical background and sensitivity to read and interpret tests. In fact, my master report consisted of exposing what I consider fractal elements in the novel José Trigo by Mexican author Fernando del Paso. This work led me to my admission at a doctorate program at the Spanish and Portuguese Department of the University of Texas at Austin. My research ended up focusing on literary representations of scientific discoveries in Latin American narrative. Structures um, from the 20th and 21st centuries. Many Latin American writers of this period um, implemented complex narrative structures and strategies to communicate underlying themes of time and space and craft a fictional works and aesthetic manifestos that are not only aimed to reproduce reality, but also to invent it. This effort reveals a connection between aesthetics and the emergence of a new and pivotal scientific paradigm that deals with alternative ways of understanding, representing, and creating reality. Apart from implementing scientific theories and principles that offer a multifaceted approach to the study of literature, my goal has been to contribute to the understanding and dissemination of otherwise unattainable scientific, theoretical, and experimental knowledge. My mentor at the University of Texas, Professor Cesar Salgado, invited me to conduct research on José Lezama Lima, arguably the most important Cuban writer of the 20th century. Lezama is well known as a poet, essayist, cultural promoter, and novelist, but not as a scientist. In fact, there seems to be no evidence of any concrete relationship between him and any pure science discipline. Nonetheless, it was ultimately my preliminary research on this summer that inspired me to write this book. I immediately buried myself in the summer's world, and with much naivety, I subscribed to, the, to his idea that only difficult topics could be mentally stimulating. In Spanish, he says, solo lo difícil es estimulante. I had the conviction that the principles of geometry, physics, and arithmetic could help me dissect the complexities of his writing. Soon, I found one of his first tests, El Secreto de Garcilaso, published in 1937. In this crossover between essay and poetry, Lesama postulates, among other things, that the main feature of Garcilaso's poetry is a spectral appropriation of space and time. He proposes something revolutionary at the time regarding Garcilaso. Many aesthetic manifestations, he contends, may be explained and are closely related to the mathematics of the time. 
en el secreto de Garcilaso, les ama alludes to space-time physics, sinuosity of time, and Riemann's geometry. And I just highlight in red those expressions in, in a quotation that I took from that secreto de Garcilaso. I want to emphasize that these are the Sama's words in 1937. My thought then was, what if I applied to Lesama the tools he uses to understand Garcilaso? I understood the difference between Euclidean and non-Euclidean geometries, and I knew that one of the latter was the one proposed by 19th century German mathematician Bernard Riemann. I found that extremely fascinated, fascinating since it implied, in very simple terms, a distinction between the real and unreal. So the space-time physics and the sinuosity of time, both associated with the theory of relativity, I started studying and learning everything I could. I was intrigued to find Lesama's inspiration for these ideas. I needed to know what readings had provoked <coughs> such a statement. When I visited Havana, for the first time, my main task was to trace what was left of Lesama's library. Likewise, I looked for, for school academic programs and Cuban scientific publication from the early 20th century to understand what types of literature and reading material young Lesama could have been exposed to. By 1937, Lesama was in his mid-20s and only a few prominent scientists worldwide understood the theory of relativity. To be perfectly honest, I believe Lesama never really understood it. <laughs> and I guess he didn't care. <laughs> Even so, it is an uncertain and very difficult enterprise to establish connections between Lesama's literary works and the disciplines of science I was determined to find out how certain scientific discoveries and developments were embraced in the cultural imaginary of Cuba during the first half of the 20th century and how they inform Lesama's aesthetic production. While in Havana, my interest for the history of science in Cuba took off. This country is an island that given its strategic location and geopolitical value, has been the focal point of scientific developments in Western science, especially after the Industrial Revolution. With its extensive and tragic history associated with sugar cane and tobacco, Cuba had become like a sophisticated network of research laboratories. I learned about people like Felix Varela, Jose Antonio Sacco, and Carlos Juan Finlay. But one event among the many milestones of Cuba's scientific history was crucial for my work. It had to do with Albert Einstein's brief visit to the port of Havana on December 19, 100, uh, 1930. That, was Lesama's, that day was Lesama's 20th birthday, but it was also the 130th anniversary of the arrival of Alexander von Humboldt to Cuba. Einstein's visit took place three months after a famous student revolt against Gerardo Machado's regime, constituting an important reference to several parts of Paradiso, Lesama's first novel published in 1966. I was very lucky to interview several scholars while there. A very prominent one, Jose Altshuler graciously gave me a booklet written by him doc documenting the 30 hours that Einstein, Einstein spent in Havana. Uh, I think you can see some images of that booklet there. I was also able to check newspapers of the time, like El Diario de la Marina and El Heraldo de Cuba, <clears throat> to follow the coverage of the event. What struck me the most was the detailed, elegant, and mostly accurate reviews of Einstein 
scientific accomplishments that I have found. However, the journalists were erroneously attributing to him the dismantling of the fifth postulate of Euclidean geometry, the one stating the impossibility that two parallel lines intersect. As I was reviewing this material, I was certain that that day must have been very special for Lesama and that he must have read those news and reviews. Every time I examined his writing, I understood that the concept of collapsing parallelisms that generate alternative geometries was central to his poetry. The more I read, the more I was persuaded of such connections. I began to study Lesama by using elements of the theory of relativity and of the collapse of the postulate of parallels and their associated distinction between Euclid and Riemann's geometries. As for the sinuosity of time, I found it convenient to include rudiments of quantum physics and thermodynamics. Finally, due to the recurring reference to Pythagoras and Aristotle in Lesama's writing, I have to consider aspects of number theory and logic as well. The title of the book was written by itself. I believe Cantidades Hechizadas and Silogísticas del Sobresalto encapsules both the essence of Lesama's poetry as well as my reading of it, since it powerfully shows that natural the natural and intriguing association between his writing and science. Cantidad hechizada, enchanted quantity, is an idea proposed by Lesama that is also the title of one of his essay volumes. Silogísticas o Silogística del Sobresalto, Silogística of Shock, is a concept Lesama developed as part of what he called a poetic system of knowledge of the world. The characteristics of, and properties of his system ratify the confluence of several complex artistic, philosophical, and scientific components of his writing. He uses the Latin origin of the word cantidad, quantus, meaning of what size, how much, how great, what amount, to propose a concrete summary an association of senses and suggests an extended meaning of the word. To him, cantidad means both contado and cantado, counted and sung. Thus, following a very Pythagorean approach, an, an enchanted quantity is not only a number representing measurements or calculations, but also a poetic narration that triggers enchantment and illusion. As for Silogismo del Sobresalto, the syllogism is the most outstanding component of, of Aristotelian logic. The image or notion of Silogismo del Sobresalto in terms of the Sama, just like that of Cantidad Hechizada, extends its meaning to present not only a map of reasoning, but also the poetic channels and the sensorial answers to the act of inferring. I knew that science in Lesama, like all his references, is hidden, and I decided to call my book Cantidades Hechizadas y Silogísticas del Sobresalto, La Secreta Ciencia de José Lesama Lima. My book demonstrates that Lesama appears to use conceptual underpinnings of scientific, scientific theories to foster his rhetorical devices. I establish these connections with respect to several key concepts from mathematics and logic, such as those that form part of the thinking of Eratosthenes, Aristotle, Gottlob Frege, and Bertrand Russell. I also incorporate developments in geometry, including Euclid and Bernard Riemann, and physics, including Aristotle, Epicurus, Einstein, Lord Kelvin, and Schrodinger. Another main argument in my book is that 
through the works of Albert Einstein and Lissama, we can see how scientists and poets often use common conceptual tools and approaches to create their systems, the system of knowledge. The reports produced by theoretical scientists utilize communication tools that resemble the rhetorical devices of poets, you know, metaphors, thought experiments, you name it. And conversely, poets deploy techniques of thought that lead to those employed by theoretical scientists. This technique of writing, in fact, is the hallmark of Lesama's corpus. The book consists of an introduction, six chapters, an epilogue, and a conclusion. In the introduction, I map out the role that science played in Lesama's writing and describe the contest for scientific inquiry in 20th century Cuba and in the Caribbean. Chapter one, La Entrada de Einstein in La Habana, deals with the repercussions of Albert Einstein's brief visit to Havana in 1930, in the formation of young Lesama and in the intellectual life of Cuba. This event allows the dislocation of the parallelism between Einstein and Lesama and between science and poetry. I present here a detailed revision of the remains of Lesama's library to know the presence of scientific books in his collection and his reading habits. There is a thorough analysis on the circulation of the theory of relativity in the main Havana libraries in the 1920s and 1930s and literature that covers Einstein's visit to Havana by Cuban newspapers of the time. Discussions in the remaining five chapters allude to a specific scientific theories that help analyze Lesama's specific tests. Chapter two, Lesama el tiempo y los relojes links Lesama's work to the special theory of relativity. A close reading of three of the most temporal tests by Lesama, Incesante temporalidad, el cubilete de cuatro relojes, and reojos al reloj, contributes to verify the variety and complexity of the connections that can be established with the poetic system and the application by Lesama of ideas from relativity. Lesama talks about temporal jokes and ends incessante temporalidad with a limerick that illustrates the paradoxes of time when traveling close to the speed of flight. And this is an example, a concrete example, in which you can see a brief test of Lesama with this scientific connection. And I want, just want to read it in Spanish, if you don't mind. Era así una niña llamada Leonor que a la luz vencía corriendo mejor. Cuando estaba ausente relativamente, regresaba siempre la noche anterior. <laughs> in chapter three, La muerte del tiempo y la configuración poética del espacio-tiempo, I study how the principles considered by Lesama in his 1942 poem, Muerte del Tiempo, are consistent with those of the general theory of relativity. So while chapter two is on special relativity, this is on general relativity. In many ways, this point embodies the essence of Lesama's theory of the image, which he refined in subsequent in subsequent tests. This is further magnified in chapter 12 of Paradiso. The temporal considerations already established around time are amplified here to include spatial manifolds. To, so the dream territory is described as the one that permits the poetic configuration of the continuum space-time. In chapter four, Geometria Rimaniana, Ajedrez, Huracanes Lesamianos, the emphasis is on geometry, and the discussion is built around the res resonance of the paradigmatic shift from Euclidean to Riemann geometry during, during the 19th century. The Riemann geometry is akin to the fantastic and the impossible. This change can be seen both through the concrete renovation of the concept of parallelism 
and through the representation of new rules in geometry. Lesama expresses it and applies it through his own proposals to modify the essence of the chess game in chapter 7 of Paradiso and in the essay Alfonso X el Sabio y Capablanca. Chapter 5, Parallelismos in Crisis, focuses on concrete applications in Lesama's work on the collapse of parallelism and on the metaphor of non-Euclidean geometries. First, through the method of counterpoint and the incorporation of a physical fourth dimension in Lesama's poetic space. Something effectively illustrated in El Viajero Inmóvil, a 2008 film by Cuban director Tomás Piar. Actually, the images in the last couple of slides are taken from that film. Finally, the topic of resurrection is addressed as the ultimate expression of counterpoint by means of the collapse of parallelism, temporal and spatial transpositions, and interdimensional contacts. Chapter 6, La Cantidad Sexuada, Colloquio con los Números, dives into, the, uh, into arithmetic and logical connections and shows how the essence of the numbers and the relationships between them correspond to the complex tensions and sexual encounters Lesama refers to in his work. Following the Pythagorean principle that everything is number, it is determined what type of numbers are Paradiso's characters, Focion, Phronesis, Semi, and Opiano Licario. After reviewing the historic evolution of the concept of number and the presence of enchanted quantities in the work of Lesama, it is shown how the singing of Pythagorean numerals in chapter 11 of Paradiso corresponds to the conjunction in which Gottlob Frege and Bertrand Russell leave behind more than 2,000 years of Aristotelian logic to set the foundations of modern logic. A close reading of chapter 6 of a Piano Licario reveals the mystery of a of a numerical sequence that is skillfully and unexpectedly incorporates the first seven prime numbers and the number one, the monad, in terms of Pythagoras. And this is another brief example that I want to show you to explain, in my opinion, how he writes and how I read it. You know, this is a brief paragraph of chapter six of a Piano Licario in which uh, highlighted in red, you can see some words that correspond to numbers. The number they correspond to are the numbers, uh, let me see, 1, 2, 4, 6, 10, 12, and 16. I was thinking, as a mathematician, what kind of formula, if any, is there for that sequence? And I found it. And that sequence is exactly the result of finding the seven first prime number minus one. So it's combining prime numbers and one, which in a way is what I explain in the book is the concept of sexuality in terms of the sum, right? You see the seven first prime numbers, two, three, five, seven, 11, 13, 17, and each one minus one gives the, exactly the number he presents in that sequence, in that test, right? Moving on. The epilogue, El Secreto de Lesama, analyzes El Secreto de Garcilaso and reveals how, through a detailed reading of the life and work of Garcilaso, Lesama presents his poetic manifesto as he makes relevant scientific appropriations. In the conclusion, Oro Luminoso de Profecias, I show how the correspondence between arts and science proposed by Lesama anticipates later formulations of Baroque and neo-Baroque theories by the writers Severo Sardui in 1974 and Omar Calabres in 1987. As already mentioned, Lesama holds that expressions attempted in cultural creations 
are weightlessly resolved in other arts. This is the same principle that he would call resonancia and Sardou would call retombe. Resonancia or retombe, what matters is that they depict a non-hierarchical relationship between different cultural, philosophical, scientific, and aesthetic manifestations. Just like Piano Licario shows the way to Jose Semi, the Sama guy Sardui, who in turn does the same to Calabres. In 2018, I was asked to present at two exhibitions in Miami. First at FIU and then at the University of Miami, showcasing Colombian artist Pedro Villalba Ospina and his work on Cien Años de Soledad. The subject of, this ex of his exhibition was a handmade bio bibliophile edition crafted with 120 etchings of the novel by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. You can see an image of Pedro and Garcia Marquez when Pedro finally met Garcia Marquez in Havana, in, I guess, in 2006. And you can see in the background some of the etchings he was, uh, that there was in the exhibition. To prepare my presentation, I interviewed Pedro several times and got to learn about his life and career. I was very impressed when I found out about some of his previous works, especially one on the restoration of historic Chinese pieces that a very wealthy Colombian family had acquired. One of the most outstanding pieces he created in those days, in my opinion, is known as Poema Cartográfico, El Conocimiento Servido, a painting on a large wooden dinner table that you can see there. One of the images of that painting in one of those corners is called Esfera con Paisaje Nocturno y Cultura Griega. And it caught my attention because it was extremely beautiful and because I felt it was painted like he was, Pedro was, unconsciously but firmly following Lesama's poetry. I asked Pedro permission to use the image in my book and he accepted. I am convinced that this painting was made for my book. <laughs> I want to acknowledge and thank all the people who read earlier versions of my manuscript and whose ideas, editions, suggestions, and support helping me to finish. Cesar Salgado, <clears throat> Yolanda Martinez San Miguel, Lilian Mansor, Lili Lugo, Joyce Desner, Marcela Martinez, Daniela Ferrero, Caterine Perez, Julieta Leo, Yamile Limonta, Sidney Billings, my colleagues at the Michelle Bowman Underwood Department of Modern Languages and Literature, I say that right away, yeah. <laughs> and all my colleagues at UM. Most, very importantly, my students and my students at UM, my main source of inspiration. I, I thank the ones that are here tonight. Thank you so much for being here. Pedro Villalba Ospina, Francisco Diaz Granados, Maria Dolores Jaramillo, Rachel Barra, the Connors family, and last but not least, my family and friends in Bogota. And there you have it. It is with humility and hope that I invite you to read my book. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, questions? So we have time for questions, so I'll let you have a look. I was intrigued by the sucesión de números yeah, yeah. and sexuality. Yeah. Can you yeah, of like course. That and explain the sexuality part of it? Yeah, of course. I, I think that <laughs> I, 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 in the book I call about <laughs> in the book I call about something that uh, is uh, prime sexuality, in which I think last time I was exposed to this group of people who have like. Uh, being gay or whatever, that what I was, I was having like this sexuality in which, you know, prime numbers are related somehow to the number one and to themselves because they have only two factors. And that's kind of the principle he believes in about sexuality 
when you, I mean, Narcissus, for example, is only dealing with himself, but also with only the one. And prime numbers, among numbers, are like a special kind of community, which is similar to some mm. sort of the communities. And there are more things, but essentially that's the one that I, I was kind of referring to. And, and you can see there that he's, in that sequence, he's, you know, listing some prime numbers on the number one, which is like a symbol of that, yeah. That's pretty much what I found. Yes, Margarita. Follow up on his question. Um, oh. Hello. I am. Hello. Okay. He's okay. working. He's working. I, to follow up on the numbers, um, so you presented a piece of a text where those numbers are marked mm -hmm. red. Um, that is part of the, the, the book. Yeah. Of, 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 uh, of no, his of, book. Yes, it's chapter of chapter six of the second novel of Piano Licario. In your book, I mm -hmm. haven't seen the, the content mm -hmm. of the book, but do you explain what you just said yeah. in terms of having the list yeah, 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 of the yeah, numbers? Yeah, yeah. And I build up like the it's whole. It's all there because uh, it's fascinating mm -hmm. the way you connect and the Sama connected without even knowing because I don't think he knew. You said he had no idea about relativity. Uh, I mean, that's relativity. open to, <laughs> to interpretation, but no. I think he was, I don't know, but he's just there, you know. He's there, yeah. yeah. So mm. he somehow figured out, but you said you found the connection, you found the formula. So is your work based on the readings of his uh, the, Work. That's a very good question. Yes. So you, yeah, I, I guess you, you I, discovered that formula. I don't think that Sama was intentionally doing that, but it's there, and I guess to a certain unconscious level, is there, and and because he was trying to find like ways, like oblique ways of expressing things, I guess sexuality is expressed to his connection with these prime numbers and the monad or the number one. That's that's the way I see it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, when, when, when Paradiso was published in 1966, most of the sexual part of Paradiso is in Chapter 8, and that was scandal in Cuba, so the book was forbidden <laughs> for, for that reason. <laughs> yeah. So my question actually follows up on, on her question because you make Lesama look like a, I think like a more organized thinker. He's not. <laughs> and I remember like engaging with like Expresión Americana and all his reference to El Barroco and all the footnotes are wrong. Yeah. He was a very like voracious but at the same time disorganized thinker. Disorganized. So how do you manage that? Like how do you engage with that? What were some of the challenges that you found? When just, I just learned, and I remember talking to this Cuban writer and, and scholar, Margarita Mateo Palma, who has written a lot about the summer. And he, he was talking about Chopeo, thinking in Cuban terms, like he's all the time playing with those quotations, making up stuff. So you got to understand that, because my first frustration was like, when I read about El Secreto de Garcilaso, I, I felt like I got to look where he got that from. And the, first, the only book I found on Einstein was published like in 1950 in his library, I mean. So it wasn't possible to trace that. So it wasn't possible to figure him out. Like, you never know. But still, my, my, my take is like you can read and reorganize in your own terms what is there. Perhaps he didn't mean it like that. But still, it's a very valuable reading. And, and it's good because he is so provocative. He is so that perhaps all of this organization can be, you know, uh, like uh, an inspiration for creating new things. That's the way it's so, yeah. Vivian? Okay. My question is so much simpler. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Vivian. So, uh, oh, no, no, okay. Well, I don't like that microphone because my voice looks different, sounds different to me. I don't recognize myself. So I'd like to see if you could go back to the slide of uh, La Niña Leonor. And, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I, I mean, I was wondering, I, I thought it was a tremendous, very interesting way because if she was traveling faster than the speed of light, of course. Which is impossible. Yeah, yeah, but if she did, she would be, of course, being sent back. 
Yeah. Because, I mean, mm -hmm. there's no, if you, there's nobody can go faster, nothing can go faster than the speed of light. Yeah. If somebody did, you would be pushed back. Yeah, that, that's, that creates a lot of paradoxes, and that was part yeah. of Einstein's, yeah. you know, contributions. So I was just wondering about the, the metric of the poem. I mean, era una, una niña llamada Leonor, que la luz vencida, corriendo mejor. If it has some meaning, the way, I mean, the mm -hmm. strophe, the, the, the syllabic, the syllables, etc., because that's something that has to do with poetry and also, I guess, with Garcilaso, which I was expecting to hear a little bit more about the numerology of poetry, mm -hmm. what it does in terms of I like... I didn't study that part, actually. I didn't. I just checked, like, this is the end of this short essay by Lesama, which is called Incesante Temporalidad. Uh -huh. And in Incesante Temporalidad, at the time, and when I read it, I was more like thinking of all the connections he presents, he, he poses in terms of, like, connected to relativity. And I was surprised nobody knew or nobody noticed before that he was actually given sort of a poetic version of the relativity. And he ends like that because he talks about the, 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 the temporal jokes, like he does in the other ones, like Reojos al Reloj and El Cubilete de Cuatro Reloj. But I wasn't considering the numerical part of it, but I should do it, and thank you for that. So the numbers. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was thinking more in... Uh, Cristina? When I think of La Sama, I always think of the Cuban movie, uh, Reza y Chocolate. Yeah, yeah, of and, course. Uh, in addition to the, you know, the topic of queer sexuality in the film, there's also one of the four issues or tensions is between high culture and local. Yeah. And then on top of that, now you mentioned the Chopeo in relation to uh, La Sama. So I was wondering if you could comment on that. You know, this book, you know, your topic with, you know, math and all these erudite uh, concepts seems like it would be purely high culture, but I'm wondering what you see in terms of the relationship between high and low culture in, in the Sama, if it comes out other way in, in your project or, or no? Later on, like, I guess it was, um, what's the name of this author? Uh, well, I'm, I forget, I, my memory is not good. But decided to create a new, uh, which is the best, in my opinion, edition of uh, Paradiso, in which he recovers the original test. Mm -hmm. But I guess that talks about that, what you mentioned about the high and, and the low culture. You know, like he was very intuitive, and 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 I and my point is like, I don't want to make him look like he was getting all this thing by his own. I'm just, I think there's another level in which a book, you know exists again by means of the readings you can do about it. Mm. Yeah, and, and I guess that's what we do, in a way. That's the essence of what we do. Yeah. Well, with that, let's give a big hand. Thank you.